I've been here looking at some of the old stuff from the other booths that we did and um, trying to get my head around what that's going to look like. A lot of this code's going to need to be cleaned up. I'm going to try it really hard to not be triggered into freaking out about the organization of all the knowledge that's here. Um, that always, you know, like puts me into the remake, the knowledge net mode. I'm trying to avoid that for now for a few, for a few minutes anyway. And to just get my head around the, the different divisions, we already talked about this a little bit earlier, but, um, put some more specifics around it. Um, and I'm going to grab something from my notes, which kind of stuck out. I'm going to grab this little table. This is all marked down, Pandoc marked down. Uh, my note thing automatically publishes any changes to notes. So unfortunately I have to sit through this. Um, and yeah, so let's do this. Let's say, um, uh, I got the old boost there. I'm trying to figure out a way to, 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 to get to, to, to do this right now. I have this set to be an aggregate type, which means that it's going to grab a bunch of other nodes. Uh, to create itself event when the knowledge net tool is finished. Um, and then this stuff will just be an introduction to that. So I'm going to go ahead and put it here. Um, but uh, what, I'm, what I'm wondering about is how to... How's it going, Big Hamble? So what I'm wondering about is how to associate a boost, if I should associate a boost with a book. And when I mean book, I mean, you know, something you can print out, but mostly something that would have a knowledge base to go with it. And um, kind of equating this to courses. Um, yeah. So uh, I think I'm going to change this to be category and boost here. And... Um, and yeah, and and this is gonna be tricky. I kind of wish I had a main because some good mind mapping software. There isn't anything good out there right now. Um, this is something I really want to add to the knowledge net because I lived and breathed in mind map. Uh, it was a Mac tool back in the day. All the mind mappers that are out there now kind of suck. I haven't been able to find a good one since that, since they stopped making that one. Mind mapping is one of the best ways to just dump and make sure you get everything. I, some of my best term papers, you know, 20 page papers, they just were just so well organized because you could take a, you could take a mind map and then it would, um, it would, it would do the rest for you properly. I'm most surprised that that, that that made a, another window. I thought I had that fixed. I guess not. So, um, so yeah, anyway, uh, my mapping software. I was wondering if there's like, I used to, you could do it with a deck. The problem with all the existing ones is that they don't let you derive an outline from the mind map. And that, that was really something that, um, this company, they finally went bankrupt, I guess, or got bought out. Um, did, I think they got bought by, was it lucid chart? Um, Mind Meister. Now let's read about this really quick. Uh, Mind Meister is powerful features of blah, blah, blah. Beautiful map theme. Attached documents, visuals. I want to make an open source version of this. It's actually really use, worth using. It's not that hard. Um, Just Markdown files. Yeah, and I use Markdown too. But the, the problem is, is that... I don't know. It's uh, when you want to move around the associations. That's that's the hard part, right? So so yeah, that's that's been my uh, nemesis. Is it's like you can't really do that easily. Um, so yeah, I mean, attached documents, visuals. I don't want that. 
The one thing that all of the mind mappers, the new ones do, that they don't do, is they don't provide outlining. And I really love that. That was something that was really, really great. Um, so anyway, I guess I'll just use, and you're absolutely right. I mean, that's how I've been doing it up to this point is I've just been doing, I've just been doing outlining in, in Markdown, uh, for stuff. And I, you know, I started one earlier. I got a, a go one going, right. That was, and, uh, I started out organizing that as a book and I've been talking about books earlier this morning. It's really not the book that I want. I just want some sort of like category or, or sort of large chunk of knowledge that I can track. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, it's a course, right? It's a course that you run through yourself, like a self-paced course kind of thing. So Code Things became the name of this book um, that might go with it. Uh, and and that's really that's really that's really what what I what I want is to to tie this anyway. So this is a markdown thing. Problem is, is if I want to reassociate something, I have to like indent it and I have to copy it over and everything. It's like writing code, which is fine, but it's a little less free flowing at the creative level, you know. Like when you're trying to trying to just outline a thing. Um, I mean, I, I know how I want to teach programming. That that I've, I've known that for a long time. I've been doing it that way for a very long time, like seven years or so. And uh, and I know what works. I've 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 actually changed my direction during sessions before by asking people which one is which thing is clearer, this or that. So it's just a matter of capturing all that. And I have hundreds of files in Python that I gotta go. My GitHub, I gotta clean up anyway. So that whole effort. This is all back to people who have been watching me for a while. Know that I'm still struggling since I haven't since January with organizing all the content that I've just been producing as a part of my skill stack um, company. Um, and you know, there's there's lots of little side projects that are related to that. Um, but for some reason, I mean, tonight, uh, do I need help? Hey, how's it going? Uh, well, I do need help organizing it, and um, I mean, maybe it is time for me to reach out and and get it get it out there so people can can help me organize it. But I and I we've we've done this before when we went when we were planning the boost before I tried the first beginner boost, which was successful for the first month or so, and then it really outpaced everybody. And we had a snag in the book I was using because it was just not working. It was really old. It was William Schott's book, which is great. And I was running under the premise that, you know, rather than write my own books, uh, I'm really trying to be hard to be a good citizen, by the way. I don't want to write all of my own stuff. Um, but every time, every single time I try to use something that exists, I get burned every time, even on the best stuff. And Schatz is a great author. He's got a really nice writing style. Same with Eloquent JavaScript. Really great book. But... Every one of them is just just misses on on really important things that I've seen work in the classroom setting or or even with individuals, and so they need to be tweaked and adapted. And Eloquent JavaScript is is Creative Commons, so I could even change that book if I wanted to. But it's JavaScript. Then I got this new thing where you know I agree with the author of the JavaScript book that says JavaScript is not the best first language to learn because it's not strictly typed and therefore it's really loosey goosey and lets you make mistakes that you would have been protected for making had you had a stricter language. And it's all the rage right now to have a language that forces you to do the right thing. That's what Rust is, you know, claiming. And and so it actually argues very, very clearly that Go is the best first language, or at least it hypothetically could be. Uh, I don't use TypeScript, no. No, I, I, TypeScript is great. If you're going to do a large JavaScript project, I would definitely use TypeScript, and I love Dino. But uh, just JavaScript in general is just not a good language. It's just not. I'm sorry. I mean, it's, it, for most things that you need to make. J JavaScript at this point, just to fair disclosure here, I'm not slamming. I don't want to start a language war, but JavaScript up to this point has been, for the last three years, has been the first language I've been having people learn. And for the four years before that, uh, I taught Python as a first language. And I have been tempted to teach uh, Go as a first language. There was only one experimental student I did it with uh, probably th three years ago when Go came out. And I gave him the, the a book, this is a Stanford textbook. We actually pre-ordered them like two months before they came out. It's the first book actually about Go, period. 
uh, the, the Addison Wesley one, if you know it. And he got it, and he was like, I said, okay, I'm going to test you, because he's he a bright, homeschooled kid, and he's like, okay, try this. And he hated it. He didn't hate Go. He hated the book. And, uh, yeah, you finished writing your real estate book? And I'm linking to hundreds of sources where people they see the real estate statutes, right, right. Fill in the parts you can't find that already done. And I thought about doing that, too. But I think it's too suitable for it to be a first language. And see, this is this is something that's, that's interesting, is that um, uh, I think... You know, I think Malcolm, I think you you hit on a point I hadn't even thought about, which is, um, you know, that TypeScript is a first language. And, you know, I, I, I love JavaScript syntax. I've said it over and over. It has problems, obviously, the triple equal sign I could deal without. But it's really, JavaScript is fantastic for teaching, for teaching really true programming uh, because you can teach everything with it. You can teach... Uh, you know, monkey patch dynamic methods kind of thing, you know, that so you can get true object-oriented programming, not class-based object-oriented programming. According to the original authors, this is all Jim Copeland. You can go watch his YouTube videos on this, and he'll explain in depth why Java is not an object-oriented programming language. Um, and and uh, it's a class-based object language. It's not object-oriented programming. Anyway, so so TypeScript and JavaScript... Uh, uh, now I have in Python to write and go. Yeah, and, and people have been doing that a lot. They've been doing that a lot. They've been proofing out stuff in Go in Python and then moving to Go. I actually do that. My, my I tend to do it with Bash myself because Bash, in fact, Bash and Go is a match made in heaven. It really is. I mean, it just, it just is because Bash, Bash has has gotten so powerful. I mean, people don't know they can do maps and arrays and pointers and stuff in Bash. They're like, why would you possibly do that? Well, you know, if you're if you're scripting and you want something done fast, usually you want it on the command line. And um, unless you want web related stuff, you know, you don't need JavaScript. You can do that in uh, in, in Bash, as far as I'm concerned. In fact, Bash uh, Bash and JavaScript kind of squeezed Python out for me for beginners. Uh, particularly since JavaScript, and this is the other thing I was going to say. So JavaScript teaches really, really, really good language for teaching first class functions because you can assign them. You can use anonymous functions. Python, you can't. Python doesn't have a switch statement. You know, there's just a bunch of things about Python that get really annoying. The most annoying of all, in, besides the white space, is the uh, lack of um, anonymous functions. And I, I just, I, that is just, that makes, that makes teaching uh, what should be beginner level concepts a lot more complicated than it should be that and, and concurrency concurrency is abysmal in Python, uh, for a beginner, for a beginner, uh, go concurrency is drop dead simple. Just put the word go in front of this function. Done. <laughs> Seriously. It's like, uh, PHP. Oh God, no, <laughs> don't even say PHP. <laughs> so this is, this is me just kind of brainstorming I've already decided what the content will be in my booths and, and, and that's based on a lot of objective experience working with people. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what troubles am I running into? Well, right now the biggest trouble I'm having as usual is, 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 is paring down the branches of all of the stuff that we could learn. You know, and that's just always a problem when you're doing education of any kind. It's just like, you know, when you're doing curriculum design and stuff, and I've, you know, I've, I'm on, I just got uh, invited to another advisory board for a college. Um, I've, I've sort of, God, for what, 15, 20 years, I've been, I've been serving on advisory boards for, for educational institutions to help them come up with their curriculum and stuff. Uh, just, you know, to help them keep it real. And, uh, but, but, you know, God, we just had a report. I had a guy report that, you know, HTML lists, right? There's a teacher I said, send me a screenshot of that. His 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 uh, sister was taking an HTML course in class, and was told that it was incorrect to not put a UL for an unordered list around every single list item. So so the homework, the correct answer in the homework was UL li UL li UL li UL li. I mean, it's like some of the worst HTML ever written that would get you fired from any job. And that was the correct test answer. And he was like, you remember what you've been telling me about complaining about modern education can't keep up? And the teacher actually thinks that's how you do it. And the the crazy thing is it actually renders fine. Yeah. Uh, can you believe that? Uh, any programming with HTML? Uh, yeah, we would never. Look, this is why I have HTML last in my little list here. Uh, I, I started out, look, so HTML, the reason HTML and JavaScript and CSS are really used to be in the beginning of my list, and I'm going to give you the new list here. Um, 
the reason they used to be in the beginning of my list is because they're quick hits. They make you feel powerful very quickly. And if you're just learning to code, seeing how fast you can make a web page, particularly if you're using something like Netlify and GitLab or GitHub auto pushing, it's you know for free. You just it's so powerful and it's so empowering. And immediately you can write you know book reports. You can do your own website. And you just need to know HTML and CSS and people to rage on about whether or not those are actual programming languages. There's a professor, I think it's an Oxford professor, who argues that they are because they're declarative. Um, it takes 30 seconds to see it working. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, I have a skillsec.sh server where people can literally just refresh and see their whole thing and they don't have to learn Git or anything. And, you know, now that we have Repl.it, you can do all kinds of stuff with Go as well as a first language. I mean, like right away and see the results right away. Um, and yeah, so it's super important when you're teaching uh, people, particularly young people, um, that you get them something to see right away. And the, the more color you can invoke in it, the better. The more you can invoke memes. I use memes all the time when we were teaching Python. It was full of money, Python memes. Um, and... You know, that's the entire head first approach, by the way. So if you ever see a head first book, that's exactly what they do. I didn't even know it until I opened up one of their books a while back. I was like, oh, wow, they're doing the same thing I've been doing. Only they have some science behind their approach. <laughs> I was like, mine was just like, hey, this holds their attention and they remember it because the memes, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, so we were doing like, like we did nine cat for infinite looping and stuff like that. And, and people are coming to me from established, you know, software development you know, educational backgrounds are like, what, why are you using nine cat and waffles, 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 and badgers, 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 badgers. Why are you making kids code? We have people code this. I'm saying, because it works and they remember it. So the, the, I'm actually, it's part of the dilemma I'm having. Uh, so people are asking, well, what's the problem? Why are you even having a streamer about this? And the, this is just me kind of verbalizing my change. The first most important change, which I already talked about this morning in my other stream was was making attempting Go as a first language, and um, in South Korea I was teaching four sixth graders and got C sharp uh, on Unity Game Engine. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a great way to start. Uh, I got into this whole thing because after I was kind of depressed and divorced, uh, a really good friend said, "Hey, come help me teach this game camp." I was like, "Okay." So I learned Game Maker. Yeah, if you know it, and and Game Maker is fantastic for getting people on board with, with doing stuff. And then I found eventually we had to abandon game maker because it was just people would get married to game maker is all they wanted to do. They didn't want to do anything else. It taught, it taught them computer fundamentals, but it, it's got its own language. It would, it would, it would get, get corrupted. Hi, Greg. It would, it would do all kinds of bad things and it would blow up. And, uh, and so we eventually went off of that. And then we started teaching phaser for JavaScript game development. I'm, I'm, this is what's we're talking about pruning the tree, right? So, I mean, teaching teaching phaser game development has been a fundamental part of what I've been doing for three years, at least. And it really motivates particularly young people. Uh, started teaching many Scratch today. You know, I used to I used to bag on Scratch all the time and I stopped because the three smartest, most experienced people who young people who ever came to me all had massive Scratch experience. And when they came to me, like showing showing them a function, like oh you had to pass these arguments and stuff, boom, they had no problem. The only other people who did let, about the same amount of, of of um, I suppose uh, you know ability and aptitude who came to me were people who had already gone through algebra. So I have stopped bagging on Scratch because I'm always like, well, Scratch isn't real. It's not real programming. Blah blah blah. You know what? If you're young. And, and it keep it makes you have some fun and it teaches you to think like a computer and you understand what an argument is above all, then hell yeah, go for it. Uh, most of your programming course start with variables followed by if else loops. Yes. Uh, that's funny you say that, Spivey, because I actually switched my order and started teaching functions first. And, uh, um, because in functional programming, you know, there's no state. And I, I tried that for a while and I, I've got a different approach now where I just talk about, I don't talk about coding at all. I just talk about the world we live in and how it's organized and then just how computer programming is just modeling the world we live in, in code. That's all it really is. Uh, concept of how a computer reads code yet and can't visualize its execution. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. 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 And that's that's actually that's funny you say that, Spy Boot, because that's uh, I want to show you something I've started on that I've this is this is how I've been teaching you for a long time. Um, uh, easy to keep her. Yeah. Yeah, I'm telling you, Scratch holds it holds holds young people's attention really well, because they it's a lot of immediate. It, the problem with Scratch, and I've had this problem is that it's it's a little bit of the same problem with Python. Once they realize how easy it is, they don't ever want to leave it. So they're like, why? <laughs> why do I need to learn web development? You know, it takes me a full week to get something to move as well as I could make it with Scratch in sixty seconds, sixty minutes. You know, and so it's really hard because then when people see what it actually takes, there's there's a whole line of thinking. It's not intuitive, but there's a whole line of thinking that says you actually don't want them. This is, I think, the thinking behind some of the people who promote Java still for beginners is because if if they experience something that's too easy up front, they're just going to face disappointment later when they can't use Scratch to do something they really want. And although I will say this, Scratch is all HTML5. When they moved off Flash, I was like, oh my God, yes, this is so cool. In fact, you can download, it's it's so amazing. They actually, uh, QBasic, yeah, me too. I started with Basic, uh, different Basic, but I, I, Hoskin, I think it should be a big, big deal of this. I teach proper ways of programming. Yeah, yeah. Well, for the most part, yes, I agree with that. Uh, Ruler practice, seem complex. Break it down. That's the whole computer science, the, the computer science thinking argument, right? And uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, uh, however, I, I do agree with the guy who made Code Combat. He, he, he wrote a really great blog that basically went against the tide of everyone needs to learn to code. Code, you know, you need to learn to think like a computer. And he basically said, look, you know, there's lots of ways for you to think programmatically or think what was it computational thinking is the buzzword and he's like there's a lot of ways you can learn computational thinking foreign languages teach you computational thinking uh as i've demonstrated over and over with like this pagan stuff um you know math teaches you computational thinking big time and in fact almost all the original innovators came from math background almost all um and greg's how far along you were on that book by the way if you don't mind my asking i've, I've only got on page like i'm not even like past page 100 I'm like still on the very beginning. I'd read on it. I lost my book, by the way. It's like hidden somewhere. I was like buried. Now I got to go find it again. So we've been reading The Innovators together, a bunch of us. Um, it's a it's a, a book by the guy who did the very famous biography on Steve Jobs. But The Innovators book is so far is way better than the biography. I have both of them. I got the biography for like two bucks at a at a the hardbound at uh, like some random Goodwill. Tried to learn programming when I was like 11 and got a book with an introduction, like 10 languages. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. You found a book that introduced 10 languages. That's funny because I was thinking that was novel. I was going to make a book called Learn to Polyglot Programming by Coding in Three, what is it, Seven Languages. And I paired it back to three Python, Python, Go, and, and um, JavaScript. It's a random batch script in which taught me how to read code in the first place. Two days later, I had a working note taking app. Yes. Mess of go tos, but it worked. Yeah, and my first my first program was a, a Dungeons and Dragons random character generator, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, the, when I when I could actually automatically roll up characters in the computer, I was so sold. I was like, "What?" I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And then I made a pseudo missile command game where you had to type in the numbers where you wanted to shoot once upon a time. That was like poking and that was like poking and peeking at pixels back in the day when you had 255 pixels on the screen. <laughs> Anybody remember that? <laughs> yeah, you could like literally poke and peek at pixels, right, right, right to the screen. I think you could still do that. It's just people don't do it as much. The raster approach to coding screens. Um, so again, I, if you're coming here for something official, this is the wrong place. I'm just relaxing tonight, just kind of shooting the breeze, trying to plan some stuff out, waiting for my wife. She's doing so much hard work. Bless her. Um, on the screen where you have a pipeline, uh, or what you have in the pipeline. Yeah. Well, let's see. So, so the boost. So this is this is kind of what I'm wondering. Hosky design. So I've I've already done a number of boosts. I did this. I talked about this yesterday or earlier. Um, and so first of all, what's a boost, right? A, a boost is just like something they just boost you on your way. And I I've I've started out by 
kind of having these smaller portion boosts. Uh, map the tech, tech essentials, create a code book. These are tiny little boosts. These are not, I've been calling them boosts. I've been trying to struggling with what I'm going to call a boost, period. And uh, I'm just playing around with my definitions a little bit. So right now, these are not really boosts. These are more about, these are more like tasks, right? Or skills. And, and that's ultimately what it, this all boils down to. And this just really dovetails quickly into how I see how knowledge needs to be organized because otherwise you end up repeating yourself unless you can basically essentially import uh, knowledge like you would if you're writing code instead of, but you're writing knowledge, you know, knowledge source, I call it. And that's, that's part of a much bigger conversation about knowledge net, knowledge bases, knowledge management, knowledge nodes. Uh, I don't want to get into that, but uh, so what is a boost? So as of this moment, um, I'm thinking a uh, human machine interface ever created is the on button. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, as of this moment, I'm, I'm, so I stumbled on this thing. I was like, the, the, this, this, the, let me just tell you how this came about really quick. So last two or three days, as I've been thinking and working with some beginners and on the Go programming language and where it fits in, uh, the idea of writing Go as a first language came, uh, came up really heavily and I'm getting a lot of attention, uh, because I've been programming live programming in Go and, and I've been, because I have, Go is a really, really great. I believe it's the best go-to language, ha, huh, for um, most things. It's a very utilitarian language. It was, it was mostly designed to replace Python, which says a lot right there. And um, it was never meant to replace C++, even though it was some apps in C++ were able to be replaced. That's where Rust comes in, by the way. Um, and uh, Java, of course, uh, Go is a direct, direct attack against Java. And and Robert Grissomer, one of the one of the designers, was one of the important dudes at Go on uh, I mean at Google on the Java project. I don't think he's on the Go project anymore. But anyway, so among, with all this thinking about Go, as a as it's getting more significant, we're starting to see job postings in it more and more. And I'm of course seeking more and more work in it myself, contract work and otherwise. Um, Plus, I love it. I just like writing in it. And that's another thing about, can I just say, that's another thing that's really great about running your own mentoring business is, and I strongly encourage it to anybody who wants to do it as kind of a hobby on the side or even something big. You can have 25 and have a nice hobby. You can have 150 people and have a full career. Um, it's really fun because you get to pick the tech that you have in your stack that you're mentoring on. Uh, and then people, you know, people gravitate to you who 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 are in that tech stack. Uh, doesn't mean you have to only force them to stick there. Obviously, that's not being a good mentor to force people to do anything. But it's so much more fun when you can uh, stay proficient in a, a, you know a particular stack and then and then help others to you know work in that stack as well. And, uh, and there's no way we can all stay up to speed on everything. And, and you know I, that's where I made it about the teacher. I, I feel really bad because you know the teacher doesn't even know how to code the web page, but yet they have to. They have to teach how to do it. And I've had a director, I had the director of web technology and gaming simulation at a, at a community college that shall not be named, tell me he had never ever, it was over beer, he told me he had never made a web page, ever. So at least as you're, when you're mentoring, you need to, I think you, need, you shouldn't be teaching unless you know how to do it and you've done it already yourself at least once. Package ecosystem big time. Uh, yeah, the, the thing with TypeScript is... Uh, yeah, I look. I I look. I know why people use TypeScript. I just never will use it for anything because I don't need it. There, there's there's nothing that TypeScript offers me, uh, and frankly, I don't think there's much that TypeScript offers most people, unless you're doing something really huge in the web browser, and 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 you know something where WebAssembly is not going to help you. Like I, I've seen entire three D applications done in TypeScript like millions of lines of code in TypeScript that have been rendered in the browser. So if you have to use the web engine as your as your thing, then yeah, use TypeScript. Uh, the, the days of using JavaScript, the interpreted language in general, the days of using interpreted languages on the, um, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, lest anybody watching this not understand. Um, yeah, but but it, the, the writing is really on the wall. If you're paying attention to any of the business white papers and the people that are like doing case studies, nobody is deploying greenfield projects in interpreted languages on the back end anymore. It's over. 
the era i'm telling you you guys can shoot me all you want the era of interpreted languages on the back end is way over it's like over 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 uh and it's it's sad because dino is a, it would be a really fun one in that space but i think it's dead it's just it's dead there's just too there's too many other good offerings on the back end that are more performant that are better concurrent more concurrent uh that are cross platform that are cross compile you can cross compile they don't have the distribution nightmares are safer. They're just across the board. Interpreted languages on the back end are dead. And your, people who are, to, and that includes Rails, Ruby, uh, Postgre, uh, Node, uh, any, you know, any of that stuff, the Python Flask stuff. Now, and everybody who's coding in those things are supporting it right now. And there's a couple of people who are picking for new, new projects, but big shops, you know, big people, people who really know and really care about their infrastructure, they tend to not pick those things. And the ping they pick they're right now, what are they picking? If it's the back end, they're picking Go all the time. Like they're picking Go. Go is, is the dominant back end new pick. Not if you were to do a poll right now of people that you can't normally get to answer polls, I would guess I would guess that most of the backends right now are in Node, Rails, and Flask, uh, and um, and you know there's not as many in Go, but there there will be, and there's quickly they're they're quickly switching over to it if they haven't already. This is why this is why this gets back to my main point here that I'm trying to talk about, which is why I think Go. I, I want to further the momentum and go because you know I've 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 been picking them correct for a while and this one, this one is definitely off and running. In fact, it's way past <coughs> initial initial interest and in, in curiosity. Hi, Orange. I'm not coding anything right now. I'm just organizing uh, some some how how I might help some beginners. Um, yeah, let's go. So, so programming and go is the first language which is which I which I've seen and. Um, and web, what I have here is, and then I, it, strangely, this is this is something of a of a different approach for me. But I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt backend development first, uh, mostly because the entire thing. This is the new thing for me too. The entire all of my boosts and all of my material, all of it, is going to be terminal command line. And yesterday, I did a video on this already. But yesterday, I got overwhelming confirmation from the Linux Foundation uh, pages uh, and all of their free curriculum that they have on edX that the future is Linux on the command line. It is absolutely 100% Linux on the command line. And all the people that I have helped get Linux skills on the command line early, almost all of them are employed now or were actually the, or, or went on to, to college or something. And they just owned college. So, so I am really, really putting a lot of emphasis on Linux terminal mastery above everything else. In fact, we're going to learn how to keep up and take notes and be an autodidact and keep, you know, that's what learn being a PTP is. Uh, and then we're going to learn, and this, this is, these, these are not small courses. This one, I don't know how many weeks will be, but we'll figure it out. Um, and, and, and this one is, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then this one here is, uh, Linux, Linux terminal mastery, which is, as you guys know, has been my favorite thing for a very, 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 very long time because nobody teaches this stuff. This is, thank God the Linux foundation has really, really ramped up. They, they have, they are doing so many amazing things. Guys, if you are out there at the Linux, if the, if the Linux foundation ever gets a hold of this video, just let me tell you what a great thing I think you're doing. Uh, I just, I cannot get behind it enough. It actually is so good. It, it kind of triggers my original emotion when I saw Peace, Love, and Linux ads from IBM in 2000. <laughs> That's actually 1999. That was when I, I jumped ship from Nike as they're as their, on their webmaster team. And I went over to IBM and, because I wanted to do all the Linux stuff. Well, it turns out, you know, now IBM's more about Linux than it has ever been before. And there's a real part of me that's being drawn back to IBM just because of that, even though it's Red Hat and blah, blah, blah. Um, but they, you know, they, they've been putting a lot of weight and time and money into the Linux foundation and you, it shows, uh, there's been a lot of, a lot of, um, free education coming out of that, uh, that effort. So I'm super happy to hear that. I've heard the Linux foundation is even funding, uh, private open source projects. Hmm. <laughs> you know, so I'm also like kind of interested in that, uh, you know, as long as I don't have to call it GNU Linux. <laughs> which I never will. I went off on somebody in Twitter today on that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, 
back end programming in Go as a first language. All right. And uh, and then front end is just HTML, CSS from the spec, and then enough JavaScript to to tie this stuff together using the DOM. And then if you want to run off and do uh, a framework of your choice, fine. But um, this will just be enough to boost you. All right. So it, it sounds like I am going to do these as boosts. And uh, so what does that mean? How does, what is that going to be? Um, how many weeks is it going to be? What's the content going to be? Uh, these are all questions I'm just kind of brainstorming right now. Uh, just like I did on the first round of boosts, which I did in January. And so that, that content's all still there, by the way. Um, anybody who can't find the original boost content, they're all like, where'd you put the old boost content? It's like, it's all there. It's just, this is an open source repo. You can go out to GitLab slash, here it is, GitLab slash com, rwxgg, read me, and, and boost, old boost has all the original boost content. Um, I mean, episode four of Linux Boost and not of your web page for the boosts are easily available to me. Uh, this is no bait as usual. Yeah. Well, the the problem is is you're watching content that's that's now defunct, and I don't take time to take stuff down. It just takes too much time. So so yeah, Hoskin Design. What you're what you're you're gonna I, you know spoiler alert. You're gonna get through like uh, all of a sudden it's, I'm gonna drop the whole thing just out of the blue. I'm just gonna drop it, and the reason for that is because. Uh, yeah, well, okay. So if you like the content, I'm happy to hear that. I'm, I'm a very much a perfectionist. I probably shouldn't do that. Um, but, but yeah, so if you want to get to any of that content and maybe you want to spread the word, uh, that stuff is all in you know, old boost here, uh, in GitLab. So, so yeah, it is, it is here to wait. Oh yeah. I don't, I don't have the readme here, but, um, so yeah, there's the old index. Wow. Yeah. Annual calendar. So yeah, I had to kind of, I didn't delete it, but I, I needed to move it because I didn't want people to think that it was still going on. Um, and uh, so yeah, it's, I feel it should be, it should be more of a, oh, of course it should be Hoskin. And that's, that's the, the re <laughs> that's the reason. It's so funny to hear you like literally repeat the reasons to me about why I got out of it. So this is just so you know the history, since if everybody else is watching this, this is the history, right? So I got into it. I think, okay, well, we'll do this. So I'm going to develop the content as we go. We're going to build it on books. And then we got through uh, a shots book and we got to the part where we we're doing bash scripting and the, the examples were just unsustainable. I could not do them. I mean, I had to write them. And then I started organizing all the content. I started writing my own content again, like I do every time I've done it so many times. I've probably at this point, probably over 1200 uh, knowledge nodes, I call them about different things all over. And some of them are in private repos in Python and GitHub, uh, uh, all just all over. And so I started reorganizing my content and to, cause I, the, the very foundation of the knowledge net is that it needs to be a living. You need to have living not documents that have expiration dates on them that, that, you know, that change that, that notify you when something's changed that have RSS feeds that have all that. And, and I have been, building that and I've been, I'm now on my fourth iteration of it. And, and that's what, if you watch my other streams, that's what's up with Pegan and easy Mark and, you know, Barnes is always like, when's knowledge not going to be done because I need it. I, I need the knowledge and the tools to be finished so that I can go back to writing boost content. And it, so what I'm attempting right now, a little, a little, and a little sort of, I'm sort of trepid, trepidatious about the whole thing. What I'm attempting now is to kind of have these parallel efforts where I'm producing content for what will be, you know, very living document sorts of ideas. This is the whole idea against the book in the first place. I don't like books. I don't even like using the B word, but, but you know, it, it tends to get people to kind of coalesce around something. So I put it in the stream title, but, um, and so, yeah, I, this is, this is what was going on, but it's, it's more about having, having, having just a, a focus for the content and having that be a very living document. So uh, where's the schedule? Let me just show you. So the old the old boost has has a schedule in it um, and a readme here. And in fact, I even <laughs> look at this. You can you can even see here I made a hidden document that was going to be the stuff for the next boost. All right. So this is me organizing the next boost, day 12. Day three, and back then you got to remember anybody who's watching this is that this boost that went on 
we were shooting for a very specific number of days and and yet i hadn't and it was experimental i told everybody going into it is experimental so lest there be any missed expectations um but you know so then i put a bunch of to do's here uh editing terminals from the file hello blah 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 and uh this is this is meant to be this is back when i actually had ideas for things you could do to 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 you know to do these things uh i, li I linked to all the videos configuring bash <coughs> and i don't i, I kept this content around because I, I i'm going to put it back in the boost that i'm working on right now learning project ideas and this is always something i will have so my content will always have a bunch of learning project ideas for you to go out and do um and then you know here's what we're talking about here networking issues configuring links but this is all part of terminal mastery um you know and and grokking certification uh learning about hosting providers digital ocean and i this is this i will i will say this about doing these boosts is it really it really forced me to uh to to chunk you know what can i cover in one uh like 90 minute segment and and that was what this did it was very helpful for that um uh, but one of the things that this suffered from was um, a lack of content other than this plus the videos. So there was nothing you could read other than that. And I don't know if that's a bad thing. Uh, after watching the video on the oral tradition of Socrates and how uh, Bill and Ted Save the World might be a commentary on the best way to do education, which may not be literary uh, because because we are oral beings above we are above being literal beings and so which to me was very heretical to hear and i'm like wow that's interesting so we actually might learn better uh through conversation and experimentation and, and speaking to each other about it as opposed to um just reading it from a book and you know obviously reading it from a book doesn't do anything until you try stuff so um so you know, taking all of that into account, that's all new information to me, by the way, since the last time I did a boost. Um, it's, 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 it's kind of structuring my decision about whether to make a book or not. And um, so here we go, day 10, software package managers using apt, using Linux. See, this is another thing too, is like, I have it, I have this nice succinct um, Linux terminal mastery, but that's actually a lot of stuff. I mean, it's a lot of stuff, guys. That's like, that is at least, okay, how to get Linux, how to maintain Linux, what is a package manager? Uh, mastery is a big word, yeah. Uh, mastery, um, maybe we need to change that word. Linux kernel. Uh, I like using Linux terminal mastery, but um, uh, Linux terminal proficiency, how about that? Proficiency. Um, and that means, you know, navigating the terminal using VI uh, and uh, yeah, mastery. This is another thing too, is that we can actually iterate on this category. Uh, I wish I had, yeah, you're never going to have it, right? <laughs> it's like, dude, if you, for you to say that just makes me feel low and small. <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, yeah, proficiency, let's say proficiency, fluency. How about that? You know what? This is a word that's constantly debated. Like, what is the difference? I I I care about words, right? So, that between uh, fluency and proficiency, and um, fluency and proficiency. Language fluency does not necessarily equal language proficiency. This is actually a thing when you take the FBI test. Um, to for languages, I was a Russian major, and there's a test you have to take. Um, I didn't actually, I didn't take it. I studied what I would have to do to take it, and they give you a level of fluency and proficiency. Yeah, so these words have very specific meaning. Uh, I've attempted to answer this on my own way. Previously, I talked about spectrum. Blah, blah. Let's see. Uh, language fluency does not necessarily equal proficiency. Learning the distinction. Fluency is simply synonymous. Oh, I don't want to agree with that at all. But this is incorrect. Good. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen how many how many languages are you fluent in. Uh, what I can think you mean to say is how many languages are you proficient in? In other words, I, oh, whoops, I'm getting a phone call here. I'm going to answer this 
I'm going to have to mute you guys for a second. Hello. Oh, she's coming home. She's coming home about, yeah, 2013, I know. This is, I have a flip phone, just in case you're wondering, by design. I also have four smartphones, including an iPhone 7, sitting there unused in its box. For reasons that you would understand if you were in cybersecurity at all. <laughs> So I'm I'm yeah I I'm not I'm I'm not inclined to have a smartphone. There's no need for me. Now there's a lot of people who need them, and I get it, but not me. Anyway, so fluent. We were just having a little thing there. Anyway, proficient. So let's use the word proficient and move on. Um, when I say Linux kernel proficiency, that, that I have to avoid drilling down and providing all the details. This is something I always do. Is I, I provide these these like overarching categories, and then I get it, like starting to write the outline of what the thing is. And pretty soon, I can't see the overall structure of it anymore. And that's why I like mind mapping so well. Mind mapping allows you to to you know elid or close those things. And I know I can do it with VI, uh, but I don't like using folding in VI. Maybe I need to get I uh, have more fun with it. You guys know about this. You can actually fold VI stuff, yeah. And and then the question is, well, do we have a big, you know, umbrella boost, or do we have little, little tiny boosts? And uh, I I think, uh, yeah, I hate folding too, Greg. I do too. I, I the Pandoc source code is always folding in it by default. I hate it. I took it out and made my own plugin version. I forked the project because I hated it so bad. <laughs> so like, please no. Um. Anyway, so. So yeah, this these these are going to be where I'm going to be building things. So I I do think I have um, a couple of conclusions here. So I'm just going to write some bullet points here. So uh, conclusions. Uh, I don't know. Plan. I mean, I'll come back and open this later. So each boost uh, will will have a book slash knowledge base. Um, progressive knowledge app, P W P K A I call them. Uh, a progressive knowledge app is just a full method of syntax. We'll start 99 for open files and folders. Yeah, I don't, I should, pro I should probably do that. And when, when in curse, maybe I'll give it a shot someday, but not right now. Um, uh, I think that's already been saved. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, Let's see. Uh, boost. Let's see. Boost will have. Let's see. Boost. Have a book PKA. Boost will have a video series uh, that can double as audio podcast. And I really want to do that. In fact, one of the reasons that I am not depending a lot on my screen uh is for that reason i want to i want to produce a series of audio podcasts uh where certain segments can be uh done through audio and that means that i will be talking through the code i write and if somebody wants to just turn it on while they're listening to something else they can imagine the code and how it's being written uh and i'm doing that for lots of reasons including you know for the visually impaired i mean i think that there needs to be more material and content for everyone and I've known a lot of developers who are who were handicapped in some way, particularly with visual impairment. And and I um, 
I mean, I've been around a long time, so I've, I've known a lot of different type of developers. I had one guy come in when I was the teleport CGI guy in Portland, Oregon. Some guy I'd been communicating with for a very, 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 very brilliant writer and, and coder. He had been, I'd been helping him with some of his back end code that he wrote, CGI uh, code. I actually enabled uh, CGI to be used at teleport for like thousands of users. I'm super proud of it. Uh, and, but I also had to like wrangle that grout and <laughs> keep the server administrators from killing me. And, uh, and, and, uh, one of these guys come in on one of our visit days, um, and he went ahead and, uh, he came in and said, yeah, there's someone here who's been waiting to see you for a long time. And he drove in and he, he was almost a full paraplegic and he came in, he could barely move his arm to move his, his wheelchair in and he could, he could hardly speak. Um, but he could, you know, say a few words or something. And I, I was like, I asked myself, how was he even typing? You know, and, and he, I, I, he didn't, I don't think I ever figured that out to be fully honest. I, I, it didn't feel comfortable asking, <laughs> but I do know that he had written many really great emails. And, and, and at that point, I mean, I, I've had a lot of experience with people who are not, uh, you know, normies or whatever you want to call it in terms of like their abilities. And so I, I believe strongly in, in the, the power of, of audio, audio as well as visual. And, and I've been trying to figure that out too. Like, do I, do I put subtitles and YouTube does subtitling automatically. And as long as you have a really clear voice, you know, I think it can do that for you. And I do intend to do that. So, so that's, so I'm going to put that out there. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, say, um, prioritize, um, verbal explanations in addition to write or written uh, code and and so uh, uh, yeah, we'll just put it that way and and this is because I, I do feel like there's a lot of science that supports uh, uh, this is why so many people turn to, to YouTube I used to you know I, I, I was wrong actually based on the new science I'm reading or I'm, I'm because of that video I watched uh, audiobook about programming even though I've searched for it right and and you know this is this is missing this is missing we are this is honestly, I'm kind of ashamed at, at how much I would throw people under the bus, uh, um, navigating up to page K. Yes, I agree. <coughs> I've, um, I have been, uh, guilty of, of that. I have said in the past, you know, well, you know, if you need to watch or watch a video on it and you know, why can't you just go read it? And I actually think both are important because you can't, you can't search for a video usually. Um, and I think obviously scripted content is the best when you have it, uh, and it meets all of the needs. But I, I definitely want to make sure that I'm, I'm meeting everybody's um, needs. Um, so, and this is where I want to say this is where this came from. So the reason that I had these talking points here is because it was really easy for me to plan it that way. Uh, I could decide what we were going to talk about, and then I would just kind of from the hip I would go through and do it. And that's a lot of times that's how I mentor. Because I'm often push, pushing the learning off on them, on the people I'm working with, and not on, I'm not, I don't want to give you the learning. I want you to go discover it for yourself so that it sticks. And so I'll say, here, go study this. I'm not the only one who does, does this, by the way. Learning the hard way, that whole series, learning X the hard way or whatever, he started out doing this, and his books were really thin. Like, learning Python the hard way is like 60 pages. <laughs> it's like, here's some things for you to do. Go learn this. It doesn't even tell him how to do it in Python. He's like, go search for this and learn it. Now go make this. Now go search for this. Now go make this. And um, as opposed to, you know, hand-holding you. Uh, yeah, yeah. And see, that's what I'm saying. So the the hard way is actually, I think, the right way. It's it's pushing you to do the learning yourself and go to do the research. And I saw that's exactly how I mentor. And people are uh, surprised sometimes at first. I'm like, okay, go learn how to do a basic web page paragraph. Like, where am I going to go for this? Wherever you want. You mean, well, how am I going to find out? Go search it. And say, well, you're going to tell me if it's, a yes, I'll tell you if it's a bad thing. We'll go find it out. And, and, and I, you know, this, this really takes people who, who have bought into the traditional education uh, method by surprise. Well, you're just being lazy. You're not teaching me. I'm like, it's not my job to teach you. It's your job to learn. I'm just a facilitator. Um, I think, yeah, part of the hard way is a good one if you want to try that. Uh, CPP con tickets cost 150. Ooh, 
uh, entitled to have all the talks transcribed. Yeah, that'd be super cool. I, we would love to see you. Uh, yeah, those of you that are still into C++ and those kind of things, and look, you know, I'm never going to code a line of C++ willingly again in my life, but but if but if yeah, there's a lot of reason to go to some of those conventions too and those, to get them transcribed and and stuff. Um, and what, the, what have I missed here? Oh, B. Campbell says, apologies to derail. Uh, why says you prefer for projects? Oh, uh, interested in your thought on this. Uh, the short, I, I've done videos on that. My short, my short answer on the licensing thing, and we'll come back to the, to the writing. Um, my short answer is Apache, Apache 2.0, uh, is, is hands down. If you're, you, there's only really two licenses, three actually, uh, Ways of okay. Everybody needs to pick a, a permissive license, which means give everybody all the all the permission possible. Uh, I don't care about anything. I, they can rape me as much as they want, just like Apple does BSD constantly without giving any BSD credit to anyone. Does anybody? How many? Ask your mom if they if they or I, I don't mean to throw moms under the bus here, but ask ask anyone if they know that that Apple products are actually BSD. How many of them actually know that? None. It's a violation of the law. Because the law for the BSD license says you must make sure everybody knows that they're using your code, and they don't. They don't. In fact, they make a, they go to great lengths to hide the fact that they're using BSD. They're in violation of federal law, copyright law, and they don't care. And they so uh, that's so Apache. If you're going to give everything away and, and you really don't care about it, Apache and MIT uh, are the ways to do it. But Apache is better than MIT because Apache has. Re if you're going to do that, you want to make a company happy. A company that's going to use your thing has got to be really, really happy. And companies want really long, verbose, detailed patents and all that stuff. And that's what Apache does for you. Apache gives you much more explicit information. And that's why I'm not the only one, but a lot of lawyers believe that Apache is better. You can go do your own research, of course. I'm not a lawyer. Um, and the unlicensed is great if you just want to give something away. Uh, yeah. Why are people still using your products? They're only getting worse. It's true. Um uh, and if there's the other, the other license though, is if you want a non-permissive license, if you want a license that says, Hey, I, I really want to force you to give back your changes. Uh, my current favorite for that is GPL2. And, um, I don't do much code in GPL2 anymore. I, 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 I always teeter back and forth between GPL2 and, and I'm, I'm always afraid that someone's going to take some of my better code and they're just going to totally rape it. They're just going to use it and not give it to anybody. But I, I can tell you that no company will come anywhere near your code if it has GNU in it. Unless it's, unless it is literally Linux, they, companies, which has been vetted and everything, they, companies are, like IBM anyway, are terrified of any copy left that, that's out there. So that, you know, the, the whole GPL2 stuff. They're terrified of it. They will not even come close to it, even if they could do it totally legally. And and therefore, if you're afraid of your, your library or something not being adapted, then you want to take Apache for that. Uh, unlicensed is just what I do for my for my dot files. I don't care. Do whatever you want with it. Um, and then there are equivalents in that in um, in the others. All right. So back to our thing. So um, so I've got I've got uh, what I thought I could get away with by doing the beginner boost, and and I thought it was worth a try. Double licensing. I I don't know about that, man. Um, I. Uh, uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, KDE does that, right? So K, KDE is, you know, QT is like really good at that. Not KDE, QT, right? So if anybody's interested in what Encurs is saying there, you might want to, you might want to read about the history of KDE and QT. Really amazing legal history there if you're into that stuff. <laughs> Some people are. I am. Um, I thought it was interesting. It's that um, that's what they've done. They have made a very, very, very profitable business, uh, and they've also maintained their open sourceness. Um, but yeah. Anyway, so I read about that one. It's really, really interesting. Um, so back to the dilemma I have. So when I went through the boost the first round, I said I'm going to go ahead and. I'm just going to force myself to stick to a reasonably small amount of bullet points for this hour, and then we'll see how it goes. And it was really great, and I was able to write up some code, but not get crazy, right? So I was just writing a little bit of of, of code to get you going, and then you can do your own research. Uh, so let me just cut to the chase. The problem is there's not enough content out there 
to cover the stuff the way that I want to cover it. And that's what killed the boosts. Uh, there's still, to this day, there is not, and I will pay money for it, there is not a good, solid, end-to-end -end tutorial on Linux terminal proficiency. Nothing. There's nothing that covers it the way that I believe it needs to be covered. And 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 I just, it's, it's absolutely appalling that we live in 2020 and this still doesn't exist. Uh, there's not even anything that covers v Vim properly. If you think the Vim tutor is right, you're wrong. It's totally busted. Let's make one. I know. And, and that's this is what we want to do. I want to make one. Okay. In fact, I, I don't want to make one. I want to lead a collaborative community effort to make one. Right. That I, I want final say and what goes in it. I just, that's just, otherwise I don't want to do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but Vim Cottas are a thing I hear. Yeah. They totally are. Vim Cottas are cool. That's a thing out there. Um, yeah. The, 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 okay. So I have, I have opinions there too uh, on Vim. So I do not believe that everyone should learn all of the Vim isms until after mastering how to use VI without Vim. And that includes macros. Um, so you've never learned Vim without pairing. Yeah. Pairing Vim. And by the way, Greg, I'm glad you mentioned that. So now that I've gone back to pairing with Tmux on skillstack.sh, this is how I do my mentoring. It's also how I started. I have a central server. It's really, really secure. And everybody goes there and we share a Tmux session. And I actually tell them the exact things to 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 type. And that's okay. Say type GW, uh, right curly bracket to, you know, reformat and align your, your section here. For example, uh, so we got two conversations going on here. Back to the the, the licensing conversation. Uh, did the KDQ question resolve, uh, or is open source QT starting? Six point is still going to be published with twelve months delay. Uh, I don't know, man. I, I haven't been following that in curse. You have to let me know. Yeah, that that one is a big fucking deal. Sorry, it's my one swear word for the night. Um, uh, you know, I, that is a big big deal. The the fact that they finally started pulling. Their open source stuff. That's a that's a big deal. Hey, Hi. Doris Kapner, how are you doing? Nice to swap me on there. Where's they know you already. I've already outed you many times. Oh, when we went to go visit your 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 your, your we went to DorisKapner.com right. and went to promote your art. All right. We're all, we we, we <laughs> let me explain that for a second. So, unless anybody's just watching this, think I just doxed my wife without any other knowledge. So. My wife and I have we're recently completing a move, and one of the things that we're going to do in our new move is try to actually maintain our, you know, for some level of personal privacy for the first time in our marriage because <laughs> because I've been you know I've been out there I've been like running businesses and stuff it's impossible to keep yourself secret if you're running businesses but we for one time once in a you know we actually want maybe to you know, have some level of like privacy, at least with our address and things like that. And and so uh, we've decided to, to do that. But yeah, so my wife is an artist and we're like, she's going to be out there. I'm writing books. So I'm going to be out there. It's just, just hard to, to avoid it. Anyway, she just got back. I need to go talk to her here pretty soon. Let me just wrap up. Um, so let me finish reading here. Uh, the Katie, I don't know about the QD. Yeah. Apache 2 for free open source projects. Uh and what's GPL2 for? Sorry. Uh, GPL2 is the one you want to use when you are, you okay, I always say this when you're picking a license, what are you most afraid of? All right. So <laughs> if you're most afraid of no one using your stuff, Apache 2 is the best, right? Because it gives the, everybody the most protections. Uh, it ensures they have patent rights and all kinds of stuff. If, if you're afraid that somebody's going to use it so much that they're going to rape you and never let you never let your name be mentioned and they're going to make trillions of dollars off of you like Apple has done with BSD. Apple Apple is a perfect legal case study in everything wrong with permissive licenses because they have violated as much as they possibly can up to the edge and I believe past the edge and 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 that's what GPL saves you from. GPL 2, not 3. You should never use GPL 3. Uh, you know, if you're an FSF person, you can throw your tomatoes later. Uh, FSF, we won't get into that. GPL 2 is what Linux is licensed under. And that it says one thing, really. Give me your changes if you make any changes. 
Make sure the world has your changes if you make any changes to this. If you make any improvements or changes on this GPL2 software, I want them back. And that goes for Apple. So if Apple, if be, it, this is why, by the way, Apple dropped Bash and put Z Shell on. They can tell you whatever they want to tell you. That's the truth. The truth is they dropped it because they were afraid of GPL. And there's a lot of people that are afraid of GPL and GNU in general. The FSF is getting really insane uh, right now. And I'm sorry if you're an FSF person. I just strongly disagree with GPL v3 and that's just changing. So I, I people are disassociating themselves with GNU licenses in general. And um, and so you need to know all of those facts. But that hopefully that'll give you kind of a cultural feel for what's going on. Uh, you can derive your own cultural feel by by you know watching hours and hours of YouTube videos if you wish, uh, as I have done, including stuff from Torvalds and Stallman and the, all the gang, you know, talking about this. Um, but that is my impression of all of that. If if you really really want your thing adopted and people that just not even think twice about it, then just do just like do um um uh, unlicensing or free or like this is how SQLite went. So the professor I think is I he's actually here in 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 uh, in North Carolina somewhere. I, I'd love to meet him. The guy who made um, SQLite, yeah, he just unlicensed it. He released the whole thing in public 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 domain right out the gate. And that allows all kinds of flexibility. So, you know, that's now the basis of, of all of the stuff inside of Chrome. You know, all of the all of the caching is everything is also they're all SQLite databases. Um, and so, you know, that's, you know, fast forward like four years after five, seven years, I don't know, after it was released. And that's what you get. So so that's hope. I mean, I wasn't planning on talking about licensing going forward. But uh, speaking of licensing, all this content, of course, is all going to be all Creative Commons uh, uh, share alike uh, attribution, not no derivatives. Uh, SQLite is great. Um, it, it was when it came out. I'm just going to say I was actually using it at IBM. We, it was a kind of a we were kind of using it as sort of a, a caching server in front of our main database, and uh, it it didn't always hold up. Yeah, you're setting file system of operating system right now. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Sounds like a misuse. So it, yeah, it might have been a misuse. I mean, we were we were trying anything. We needed. It wasn't. It wasn't really a caching server. That's not fair. It was. It was like an extra server that had. A, 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 I call it caching server. That's. It was kind of like a caching server. <laughs> to decide some project is the best fit. Yeah. If I had, had if I had had that whole project to do over again, I would have I would have went a hundred percent with server side rendering. Yep, and I'm not talking about no fucking next. That's two swear words tonight, but Next.js or any of that stuff. I'm talking about server side rendering, and I still think server side rendering is is way way underplayed by the industry. Um, and they talked about that a lot in the Jamstack conference this week. In case you guys are wondering, J A M S T A C K Jamstack is the future of web development. So know it, love it. Uh, it's taking over Monolith Web Web WordPress. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you're going to, uh, did you have a nice talk at Google long ago? I have to go watch it. I should probably watch that because I really appreciate that dude. Um, I, I don't know his name. I just know he made an amazing contribution to the world. Uh, hopefully someday any of my contributions will be a significant, um, you know, I, anyway, so yeah, good stuff. Uh, SQLite, SQLite, you can just, just just play with it. Honestly, just play with it. Just download it and try to play with it. Uh, business and DBA. Uh, yeah, I can hide that. Um, yeah. Turtle. Yeah. No, I, I've tried that. I did that with Skillstack for a while. I hid everything under it behind there. And then, you know, if if you're if you're if you're coming to this wondering how to, you know, run your own business, I'm not the best person to ask. I have run my own business for seven, eight years, but um the business was just me. The biggest piece of advice I can give you is is don't don't. This is going to sound counterintuitive, but don't incorporate. Just just run your business as a sole proprietor, and you'll have a lot less hassle. Uh, if you're small, if you're going to go big, then yeah, you got to incorporate. I, I'd really love to talk to Mastermind about that. I, did you guys see? I'm gonna I'm gonna pump Mastermind up a little bit here. So, yeah, this came across this came across my notifications today. Um. And which you know, I get emailed about notifications and stuff. And uh, oh, hey, look, I'm streaming. <laughs> so, 
Uh, la, la, la. Brian Kent really liked before they give it to him. <laughs> anyway, where is it? Um, 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 um profile. So, so <laughs> that's so funny. Um, there we go. Mr. Mastermind, there he is. Uh, and I don't know if he's out there. He was here this morning, uh, another Twitch streamer. And, uh, yeah, it's just like a really great write up on him. Sorry for the white. Um, let me, let me, uh, turn this on. Watch him like, like, Hey, so what? that still didn't wipe that. Oh, there we go. Nope. Nope. I didn't. Oh, well. So yeah, there he is. And it talks about him giving up, uh, his job and, and moving into, uh, being his own boss. I just really like to, to, to compare notes with him on it, uh, about, you know, his direction and everything. Anyway. Uh, I tried following his course, but it's too much of him rambling and asking and asking for help. Unfortunately, I don't mean it to say, yeah, he's, he's great. Um, you know, at helping people out and, and I ask for help all the time too myself. Of course. Yeah, sure. And, um, that's, again, it's more about pushing people in the right direction. You're like where they want to go and stuff like that. Uh, and he does have a lot of good experience. So, but, uh, it, uh yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah. And he's, you know, he's doing a lot of great things out there. So, so back to this, this conclusion, let me see. I mean, I'm, I am here to answer questions for you and this is kind of a beginner boost kind of feel. So I'm, I'm feeling nostalgically inclined to, help beginners uh uh <laughs> people sometimes complain on my tomorrow morning i'll be back to work on a pagan and i ain't gonna i ain't gonna apologize for nothing i'm just gonna code <laughs> so so if you're watching you're like what what is this what are you doing i have no idea what you're doing i'm like yep sucks to be you and no <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just kidding i'm just kidding but i change i change how how i how i approach things and when i'm in mentor mode which I just wrapped up tonight, you know, I had, at nine, I had like five hours of it. Uh, I, I'm more, uh, gregarious and, uh, generous with my time and information. And, and, and frankly, I feel more motivated to make shit, uh, for people, hopefully not shit, but, uh, and, and, and so that's what I, that's what got me on this chatty, uh, chatty little evening video. I think I'm going to wrap it up here though, but, um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to wrap this, this up. I do want to summarize a little bit here, though, as we get going. Let's see. About America, Czech Republic, most most programmers on a fat paycheck. Uh, employment. Wow. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, yep. Yep, yep, yep. Well, is uh, this is actually a, a big problem. And uh, in, in America, you can't be you can't freelance very well. It's very hard. Uh, number one, you have to compete against other economies, and um, I've talked about this before. Uh, I actually tried to freelance for a while. I'm a pretty good coder, and I tried to freelance, and I, I was getting undercut by people that were working for five bucks an hour. Now, where everybody as good as I was, uh, you're making good progress. Uh, I'm locked in a half a hour now. Yeah, and, and in case you're wondering, you can't sub to my thing because I actually am following Twitch affiliate rules, which mean that you know I'm I'm bro simultaneously broadcasting to YouTube and to Twitter. And, and I don't have any input from any YouTubers yet, and I'm missing out on their chat, and I'm missing out on the Twitter chat as well. I feel really bad about that. Uh, I'm going to fix that. I, I have to write an app to use the Restream API to so this little text window down here will be populated with stuff. It shouldn't take too long. I might do that this weekend, actually. This weekend, I might bust, bust, you know, break down and actually write the app that, that integrates all of the chat into one into one from Restream because I don't like just just only answering people on Twitch. Uh, I want to be able to to, to read uh, chat from other from other input. I don't want to force people to have Twitch. Definitely, not force them to have it. In fact, let's let's take a, a moment and uh, and uh, just see what's happening on the on the YouTube. Every time I go check the YouTube, uh, there's nobody there. <laughs> so so it's like on the, you know on the YouTube. Every time I go check the YouTube, there we go. Is there anybody here? No. Look at that. So there's one watching on YouTube. Nobody cares about YouTube. It's like it's only Twitch. Twitch, Twitch is where people watch, and it kind of like that's. I don't care though because what happens with YouTube is that this gets saved. 
Hey, look, one person joined. <laughs> one person joined the YouTube. Hello, hello, uh, me, uh, says a barbaric yop into the void. <laughs> it's like nobody can hear me. No, I'm the only one here. And anyway, it's, uh, I, I do this because this is the saves off the video so people can go watch it on YouTube and sometimes they'll catch them. Uh, they know that I, that it's, what's crazy is that how many Twitter video watchers there are. Oh, who's our notifications? Oh crap. Somebody follow. That was nice. Uh, oh, Hey, look at this. Oh, Linux bots retweeting. That's scary. Uh, I don't like it when Linux bot retweets my streams cause I'm a little afraid people are going to be un, 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 uh, happy cause it, cause they got, Oh, we got some retweets, no likes yet. How many viewers? Only one viewer. What's funny is like after this has been saved for a while, I'll, I'll like go back and look at my videos that have been on Periscope on Twitter here, and there'll be like 40 watchers. I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you? So apparently it's after it gets published that they start to watch it. Um, anyway, back to something more interesting. Um, I watch and comment on your YouTube, but watch the stream and interact here. If that means anything. Oh, no, that's good to know. Thanks, Hans. Hansky Design. Um, and then you come here. Oh, wow. Cool. All right, good. This is all really great feedback. Thank you, people. Uh, chat, chat people are all bots. <laughs> it's true, too. So so let me just draw some conclusions here before I, I wrap up. The, I, I try to make sense of my of my live stream sessions in a way that, that ends with me uh, getting some value out of it uh, that I can kind of take forward. Um, so again, the boost will have a book. Uh, so that is a new decision on my part. I, I definitely want... I mean, I, I, I'm going to call it a book too, because I want to think of it in terms of a book, in terms of organization, uh, even though it will not be forcibly in book structure. You can like bounce around all you want. Uh, there's going to be lots of cross-linking and stuff like that. But uh, if, you know, this is, this is something I haven't hit yet. I can't wait to hit this problem. Uh, when I, you know, I'm committed to making like a no starch press version of the books that I write, uh, which are just knowledge bases. But what happens when you heavily depend on linking to other things, you know, uh, and I've been doing it in, in, in a knowledge node. Well, uh, uh, I suppose as I could the first time. Yes. Uh, and, and, and a lot of people like the cross linking, but then they get afraid that they got too buried in the links that they can't remember where they were. And they feel like, Hey, I didn't cover everything. <coughs> One of the goals I have with the final version of the knowledge net stuff is that it will actually trace your amount of time on a particular thing that, that only you see. So you can say, I've spent this much time on this part of the branch and a site map. Yeah. A dynamic site map and the dynamic site map will show you, okay, here's where I branched. This is how I got in there. Uh, and then it will also show you how much time you spent on a particular area. And, and I plan on adding all that kind of, 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 of analytics, uh, in, in, that will be reported, not so much so that I can tattle on people, but so that I can tell what content is uh, is being read, where, where you know what paths are good and bad, and, and all of that. And and that'll of course always be optional. It's not a I, I never ever want to violate privacy for any reason. There'll never be a login to do anything. Uh, they take through yeah, and but see but but I also want it to be entirely local. So uh, that's all stuff that's going to come out in the front end development uh, stage, which is at least a year away. Uh, I, I don't want it to be. I'm thinking it's going to be at least January before I can get get back into that. I already had a, a version of it working in view once upon a time, but um, I got to I got to come back to it and visit. That was two years ago, and uh, but I got to finish the back end stuff first, which includes the 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 the, the meta language peg in, which you're going to see me doing tomorrow. Uh, in order to get to all these other other really amazing things that are going to be built on this that that I want, and that's why I'm I'm spending the time doing it. Um, uh, yeah, I'd be growing now. I, I know and a lot of people want everything right now and that's kind of the problem. So the reason I'm having this kind of, you know, thoughtful moment is because I'm trying to decide how I can help those who want to become good programmers now while also working on my projects that are really critical and, and, and potentially, uh, you know, securing, uh, employment of some kind in addition to what I'm doing and my mentoring, now that I've cut back to 25, I was up to 125 at one point, and now I'm down to 25 by design. Uh, and I don't know over the course of two years, I'm gonna, that's going to be maintainable. It really depends on 
how much uh, my sponsorships come through. I've turned down an affiliate, so I'm going to be depending on a bunch of other income, whether it comes from. I'm a big fan of 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 getting a you know contract work, and and funding your own contributions to the world, but uh, which is why which keeps me free. But um, I might have to break down and do an NPR and do like a, a, a drive and say okay, you know something like that. Uh, and let's see if it does help with building your vision. Yeah. Uh, I absolutely do. I absolutely do want to have people help build. Uh, and, and I, 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 the, the problem with it, and I have people offer that. I've had, I've had people actually offer the first time I did the boost, there was a lot of people offering content to the boost and it was clearly getting out of control because you think it's hard to manage a project that is software. Uh, try managing a knowledge base, you know, uh, in terms of merge requests and stuff like that. It's, it's really, in fact, we we had a, a whole mentors coffee talk uh, session for for almost a year, uh, yeah. And and uh, what do I mentor people? Uh, Skillstack. Uh, you can go read all about what I mentor people on. Uh, but almost all of them are uh, uh, are are beginners. But I do have some people who are have been around for a while. Uh, in fact, we just had an engineer sign up uh, who wants to learn some more coding skills. But the answer is right here. So this is this is what I'm. Again, I'm I'm kind of selfishly motivated uh, in in part for this because I want to, as always, I want to keep, you know, isolating and focusing and getting really good at helping people learn the the stuff that's really really going to propel them uh, forward today. You know, what are the skills that are most likely to get you one of the many jobs out there? And, and speaking of jobs, um, you know. Uh, rwxgg slash jobs this is where you can read all about uh the current job market in america anyway and uh and see the main the main careers that i want to target uh you won't read things like full stack here this is uh you know this is a, a very conservative bureau of labor statistics uh data set so anyway um and uh so what else we got we used to have a, have a video series that can double as audio podcasts. We will prioritize people with verbal explanations. Um, and then there's the, the, the final decision I need to make here, and this is a real hard one for me, is how to divide the time per week uh, to IoT. Yeah, well, I don't like it either, but I, it's, more, it's, by, it's, by, it's more, about, more about embedded devices, I think, embedded, right? That's I, I would rather say embedded than IOT. I don't, I've never liked IOT. I've never, ever liked it. So I think it's more about embedded development. Internet of shit. Oh yeah, totally. Do you know about the site? Do you, do you guys have a, a, sh a Shenzhen, not a Shenzhen, um, a Shodan IO? Do you know about this? <laughs> a little bit of side information. I have, I have a lifetime over here. I need to go, I need to go. I, I haven't, that's another thing too. My, I don't play a lot of computer games. In fact, I don't play, I haven't played any for more than a year. And, uh, I'm not against them. I just don't have time right now. So, but this is a computer game I would love to play again. <laughs> I have, dude, you're so crazy. You, you, what you can find here, it's like, it's just so amazing. This is like everybody's, you know, all the computers that are just, all the devices are just online without any authentication or anything. <laughs> you dropped out of high school. <laughs> you put the time in, I think. Yeah, it is. It is. You put the time in. I mean, they're, you know, it. People like Greg in particular, they just don't have patience for, for wasting their time. And Snowden, you know, Eric Snowden. You know the story, right? So Snowden dropped out. Actually, he didn't drop out. Snowden, uh, left school. Then he 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 did his um. What is it? His uh, test? What is it called? I forget. The G something. Uh, best in moderation. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I love video games. GED, yeah. He got his GED when he was when he was like 16. So, yeah, I know. He got he got out. He left high school, got his GED like way before his senior. And he, he was in the FBI by whatever. Because he was so tired of all the crap, he was like, "I'm just gonna go get, get my degree and, and go." And it's just American education. American education is absolute crap, 
And, and it's sad. I don't like saying that, guys. I don't. I don't. But it's just objectively a fact. Uh, that any sort of degree ever, right? Isn't that funny, Greg? Isn't that amazing? As long they just want to see what you can do, right? Uh, especially back then, without studying, just based on common knowledge, the bar is very low. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it's like, so you know, look, I'm not saying go out and tell your teacher that this whole thing is crap and drop out unless that's really what you want to do and you really have you really want to put in the time to do it. Um, I kind of I call myself sort of the anti-professor on some degree because I just absolutely hate you know the system that we've been forced to use. And, and so many people prove over and over and over again that none of it is needed for you to become a, not only a good human being, but, you know, extremely proficiently skilled human being if you spend the time. And, and in fact, I would argue that some of the public education is actually getting in the way of that. I, I have a, a particularly sort of an anecdotal situation where there was one guy, I told you about him already, who was personally mentored. Uh, and was homeschooled, set up his own learning projects with his mom. It was a fantastic mom, by the way. She wasn't. She was a perfect balance between a helicopter mom and a and a mom who just kind of kept you on track. And and uh, the, the the kid was kind of an asshole. I won't lie. Um, and in fact, that's why he left. Because I eventually had to ask him to come in with his mom and talk over him making somebody feel like shit because they use Microsoft. I mean, he really went off on them in Discord. <laughs> I was like, this is inappropriate. Even though I agree with everything you said, <laughs> you can't, you know, it's like, you can't say that. That's just makes them feel bad. And they're like, no, we're out of here. So they left anyway. Um, and, but, but I, I, I guess there's, a, there's another uh, person or two uh, who were in, they're really, really smart, intelligent people who are in the traditional education system. And I watched this homeschooler, like rocket past them in skills. I mean, really just rocketed past them. And like, in like a year, he had covered all the content that these other guys had covered in like four years. And every time I came back to it, it was always like, well, no, they hadn't had any time to work on anything because of school. Hadn't had time to work on anything because of school. And well, what if you're making your own school and you're making IT a big part of your education during homeschool? And since then, I, I unabashedly recommend to anyone to drop out and homeschool or unschool. And if, as long as you can stay focused, you have to stay focused and you have to be able to present your case to the people who are going to hire you. But if you do so and you're one of those uh, type of people who can do this, that sort of thing, you know, you I you, there, you really don't have to keep to keep up. Focus is a bitch. It is. And that's why people come to me. <laughs> sometimes I'm not kidding. I'm not, I'm not picking on you, Greg, but sometimes people will come here and they'll say, dude, I just need, it's like this self-employed um, computer embedded engineer. He used to you say, Hey dude, can we just go to the, to the pub and you can be my accountability partner? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they, they, you know, it's, you, you have to hold yourself accountable. You have to just have, you know what, there's, there's all kinds of ways to do that, by the way. One of them is to just tell people what you're doing. You know, and say, hey, I this is what I'm working on. Uh, this is what I want to do. And what am I doing tonight? <laughs> it doesn't mean I'll do it. <laughs> I'm not promising you I'm going to do it. But if I but if I don't do it, you know, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt me. You know, and so I'll I'm more inclined to to follow through. They say you should do that. You should you should write down your goals. I hate that word, but you know, you should write them down. You should write down what you're doing. You should blog about it. You should tell people. Uh, you tell people what you're working on. You get sad from saying, look what I did. And and by the way, uh, community, let me just say that. Um, please join the Discord community. There is a place, uh, there's a channel in my Discord called Show and Tell. And, and you know, we maybe should add a, a room in there called Accountability. <laughs> I'm going to do that right now. I am. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go add one. I'm going to add it to right here. I'm going to say... Not for beginners. Let's do this. Let's say, um, I mean, I, I don't admin this thing at all, by the way. Everyone complains. Um, I'm going to do this social. We'll put it under social. We'll put accountability. How's that? How, how about that? What do you think of that? All right. So let's do this. Let's do this. say, say uh, a place to publicly declare what you are working on regularly. <laughs> So we can remind 
you to hold yourself <laughs> accountable. You know, you don't have to do that, but if it does help, you know, it does help to to say this is what I'm working on. If you if you if you put it out there publicly, it's like no, now you, you know, if you don't you work on it anymore, you got to you got to at least tell people why. And you, and that's exactly what I did with the boost. I felt horrible leaving it, but everybody agreed harass not remind. <laughs> yeah. So so we can harass, okay, harass so we can shame you into being accountable. <laughs> So you can harass your ass. <laughs> I I kind of want to write that so bad, but I can't. I'm not suitable for work. It's the other thing that's great about working for yourself is you don't always have to be. <laughs> On the other end of the spectrum, what do you think about ageism in tech? Oh my God, it's so real. Uh, yeah, I, I I haven't talked about ageism a lot because it's not a thing. I get a lot of young people in tech. There, there's obviously there's two forms of ageism. They're really young. Um, I have, I, I, for a long time, he's not here anymore, but I had a, a 14 year old who I should have been paying $40,000 a year for systems administration. I mean, he, he was doing it all right. And, um, and so I don't know. I mean, it, it goes both ways. I, I have no personal experience with ageism yet at my, but I will say that, uh, uh, there is a, a massive, uh, I find there's a really massive, um, culture rift between the generations uh that at least that's been my observation is that the culture rift between how we communicate is more important than the ageism question uh and you really really see this with linus torvalds and stallman and you know they're not boomers but the gen xers if, if you look at the communication styles of the boomers the gen xers i don't want this to be a fight uh, and you know the millennials and the and the the zoomers even if you look at their different communication styles and what offends them and w- how they communicate they are really different and I think that's way more important than the ageism question even though I think it's probably very real um, I won't lie I'm I'm you know I'm I look old I I'm 52 I could shave my beard I look like I was 40 if I wanted but you know I don't and so I look old and the question is is that a good thing or a bad thing. And there's a definitely a thing with young 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 people. Young people, the problem with young people is I don't think that they're as I don't believe they're a subject to ageism. I think people are more prone to hire a younger person, that, you know, a really young person, than they are to to hire uh, an older person who they don't think is kept up. Um, that's just my impression, but I don't have any objective evidence of that. When you look at the average age of these young Silicon Valley companies, this is the reason I don't want anything to do with them. Because there's this, there's this implicit, uh, for example, Mozilla. I, there's no way I'd ever work for Mozilla. And I'm glad, too, because I knew Mozilla was going to fall on its fucking face, and it did. Ha ha. Sorry, Mozilla. <laughs> I knew it. I saw it coming three years ago. I think I even brought blogged about it. I was like, this, comf- this organization is, is a disaster right now. And it's, gonna f- it's the organization of that whole thing is going to fall on its face and i it, it happened it happened it happened i predicted it. <laughs> i'm gonna say it um uh, yeah oh dude it was it was yeah they they were yeah yeah it was bad for us i mean for but you know the problem this is what this is i you know i don't want this to become a a, a rant so i'm not going to talk anymore about it i just want to say that when a company, when the people in a company get so arrogant that they start to chase down people that disagree with them on Twitter, which happened to me and to others, uh, and and harass them for for not agreeing or for being you know in one particular way or something, this is the kind of stuff that was happening. And then when they have the hubris to say, "Oh yeah, we're 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 better than everybody else, but we're going to hack everybody's computer for the sake of a television show that we really like." And then, you know, we're going to make our own language. And if you don't like our language, you suck and you're bad and you obviously don't care about software security, you know, and, and the the level of hubris is like they have Silicon Valley hubris, you know, but but they also don't have the Silicon I don't know. It, it was like a multi-billion dollar organization. Anybody thinks that it's free of Silicon Valley ism is is like fooling themselves. And the difference is, is that the roosters came home to roost and the rust company and boom 
And I feel so bad for the people who lost their jobs. I'm not saying I'm happy they lost their jobs, but that organization had it coming, baby. They had it coming. And and you could tell just by how they were managing the company and 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 everything. You could tell that they were just getting just diseased with the worst of the Silicon Valley disease. And that, that still affects some of the bigger companies there. And uh, yeah, I know I've completely destroyed my possibilities of working for Facebook or Google. And uh, the only one I would actually go to, and I really respect their team, their engineering team is Amazon. A- Amazon's engineering team, they, they might not be much mo- less evil. <laughs> but I tell you what, Amazon's engineering team is the bomb. They are like amazing. Yeah. And I, I, I interviewed, I, I've interviewed with all of them and, and, Amazon's is the one that that lured me the most. I mean, they they really are you know good. They're really good. <laughs> Google's good, but they're good for all the wrong reasons. And Amazon, I don't know. That's just me. I don't know what got me on that. It's probably time for me to stop talking now because I get myself in trouble. But but uh, yeah, GitLab is my absolute favorite company on planet Earth right now that I would that I would go work for in a heartbeat. Uh, I haven't. I'm not going to apply there yet because I want to. I want to do some other things but uh yeah so if if any of you are out there looking for jobs and you're looking you're looking for jobs that are uh, i also think there's a lot of work to be had in smaller companies um that are that are focused on things that are in line with your cultural values and and i don't think people should should look past the there might be a, a company in your in your you know you might be the the one person superhero in if for you know a small company that that you really like and you like their culture and you get along with them i don't think people should rule that out you know learn to live with less maybe they can't pay you you know one hundred and fifty thousand dollars your first year oh well live with like eighty thousand dollars a year and and work for a company that hasn't sold its soul you know and 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 become an engine of 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 you know a prosperity for for one of these companies that might not be as sexy uh, there are a number of companies that are like that, that are harder to find, frankly, and uh, hopefully we'll have some tools to help us find such companies in the future. Wink, wink, Greg. Uh, but, uh, you know, such things are hard to come by right now. GitLab with 200 IQ to go full remote before it was popular. Oh yeah. Yeah. The GitLab, you know what else? Full transparency, full transparency. Uh, yeah, I, I love GitLab. I, I cannot say enough good things about him. People make fun of how transparent the leader is. And and particularly that he's Ukrainian. Uh, you know, I, I love Sid. People make so much fun of him. And I every time they make fun of him because he's so vocal and so overly transparent with everything. It's almost like the guy who grew up in the Ukraine where Putin was famous, famously made $3 million disappear when he was put in charge of the oil down there. I know this because I was a Russian major and lived there. I actually have been to Ukraine. Yep. I was on the I was on the Deepa River. I I took a cruise ship of people all around, and I love Ukraine. Ukraine is one of my favorite countries. Um, is it because of what it's been through and everything? Хорошо, вы вы говорите по русски. They have a different accent in Ukraine. It's kind of fun. It's like they have the the American equivalent of a southern accent in Ukraine. <laughs> if you go between there and Moscow. Anyway, so I. Yeah, that's funny you mentioned that. So yeah, but but Ukrainian, I I love it. I just love. Them. I'm just gonna say it. I just I absolutely love Gitlab. I love everything they're doing. They're doing things despite what everybody said, and they continue to prove themselves. And and they continue to prove they're actually advocates of open source. Their product is 100% open source. GitHub is not. You know they they have done their best with anyway. So if if there's a company that you're looking at, at working for or contributing to, that's that's one I really believe in. Even though I, I I'm super freaking uh uh annoyed at uh at the the view i love you but they're they're i can't read their pages in links i can read github pages in links i cannot read view i cannot read gitlab pages in in links and it annoys me so i probably need to make a a pull request to fix that see but i can do that with gitlab i can't do that with github right um, that's enough talking. Uh, this has been fun. I'm going to go wind down tonight with, uh, with my wife tomorrow. We're going to be unpacking the car. I will be back as usual tomorrow, uh, coding, 
uh, yeah, replace. I completely agree. And, and I, you know what? The, here's the thing: you can actually get on the team in GitLab, and you can even fork, fork the project and try some of that, right? Um, and tomorrow, though, I just want to let you know. Uh, uh, I still there's one last conclusion here, and I don't know what it is, so I'm just going to put a punt here. Uh, planning conclusion. Um, uh, uh, balance. Uh, uh, boosts uh, with advanced uh, project uh, work. So I don't know how to do that. And I'm going to put that there. This is what I still need to work on. Uh, I, I, I just want everybody to know that I am planning on doing beginner boost content, which will be you know personal workspace, back end, front end. And I don't want anybody to think that this is going to be done in four weeks. Uh, that you're going to finish an entire Linux proficiency thing. Unless I, I'm going to be producing, con you know, a little bit of content here and there, and the whole content won't be, won't be, won't be finished for a while. And I'm sorry, that's just I can't. It's just unless somebody pays me to do it full time, I can't do that. I can't do that. I have to put time into other projects. If I could get someone to pay me to produce boost content full time, and I could support myself on fifty dollars an hour or whatever it is, you know, uh, for for eight hours a day then I would actually do that. Um, it, and I don't believe that the content can be offloaded onto other people, unfortunately. That's like, that's like you know, that's what the, is the worst thing about Wikipedia is that so much of the of the content doesn't jive because it's written by so many different authors and I just refuse to do that. Um, uh, I have a good link and check. It's a good tra Google Translate. There's also teaching. Oh, nice. Programming projects on different complexity and usefulness. Very nice, yes. Uh, I do, however, want to make a, a project uh, built um, source of, of of content, and that was why I made it RWXGG instead of just Rob's thing. Um, and I don't know what that'll look like. I, I just I don't. So tomorrow, uh, I will not be doing any beginner content tomorrow. Uh, I, I've thought about maybe putting one thing for beginners per day out there. And and then kind of building them up one at a time. Uh, I'm not. I refuse to schedule anything again. I tried that before, and it just it just built up expectations that I couldn't be, meet. And if it happens that I'm I'm doing a beginner thing, so be it. Uh, I'm starting to think that um, maybe I need to do like one beginner stream, beginner topic per day, uh, and then do like a short one, like a, you know, a 60 minute beginner topic. And then I need to do all of the rest is just development work. Uh, and, and I, I, I could maybe do that. Um, I don't know. I also need to make sure I get, I get at least two hours of other activity in my life. <laughs> or I'll fall over dead. You got to get your 10,000 steps in people. You got to get those steps in. <laughs> I know I know it's complete bunk, you know, it's not scientifically based, but I tell you what, you know, thinking it, all all 10,000 steps is is like a 5 miles, right? Go walk 5 miles a day. If you're not if you're not walking 5 miles a day, your your body's forgetting to be human. So it starts to do horrible things. How's it going Ghost Rider? Hey, Ghost Rider comes on in at the at the exact time that I'm getting ready to leave. <laughs> we might have needed your skills, Mr. Ghost Rider. Um here are some ideas for end of semester projects for programming one in our top Czech university. Oh, fantastic. Uh, let me open that. And I can't read anything. <laughs> I'll use Google Translate. I will definitely use Google Translate. Just not right now. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's oh, Sudoku is a great one. That one comes up all the time, actually. Optimal sorting. This is really great. Uh, I actually... I have probably 40 of these projects. I'd love to add these to mine. I have one called Enigma. Uh, you know, there's the whole battleship and all that stuff. Uh, I actually really like challenge-based learning that has that kind of project work involved uh, because it, it does make for, um, uh, let's see, Boost, uh, Boost will build on uh, challenge-based learning, uh, filling the gaps. So that's important. Um, I I already have some of this, guys. You can go see it. I know they're tiny. Um, but if you go to rwx.gg, these are based on this things from Python I used to do. I call it Lang Challenges, Lang Chaw. 
gamified way to drive your coding skills. Hello world. Um, hey there. Hi you. Nine cat. RGB command. Re greetings. Now comment. Now do you like waffles? See, this is just the beginning. I've got like 50 of them. I've been slowly moving them over and each of them has, and that one doesn't have anything yet, but some of these have like the requirements. So it's kind of like test based, test driven learning, but the test is you reading the requirements and fitting you know, is messing with those yourself instead of instead of writing code to do the check for you which i've written in the past and i don't intend to do again because you know you should be able to do it for any particular language um so yeah um people's attempts at those challenges can be beneficial yes and um that's another thing i wanted to do is i want to create uh, a database it's not, it's, that's the wrong word, but you know, like a collection of all the challenges and there's lots of successful attempts at doing this. So check IO has this right. Check IO, um, dot com. And then, uh, you know, exorcism lead code, all of them that some of the projects are more fun. The projects that I do tend to be silly and fun and I call them because they're more mnemonic. They're kind of more in the head first approach, um, to things, but just doing challenges is not going to be enough, right? You need to, to fill it in and that's that's where that's where this comes in uh with filling the gaps on the challenge based learning uh, but what i really really want to do if i it would be the holy grail is to have these 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 terms map to to things that are covered in a boost or a book someplace and then have them uh you know go list what list interpreter cellular automatons oh wow yeah very fascinating stuff um and God, the people in, in the Czech Republic, they definitely know how to code. I mean, the Slavic countries, the people that I've worked with, and this is not a racism thing. This is not a nationalist thing. This is me talking about people I've worked with. And the people I've worked with from the Czech Republic and from Romania, uh, I haven't worked with any Russians uh, in coding. I've worked with Russians and other things, but not that. And... Yeah, they just kick ass. I mean, they're like so good, and and it doesn't mean other people are bad. Um, it just means, uh, what do you think that is? I, you know what? I don't know. I've I've wondered a lot about. So, I'm going to say something that's going to sound re very very racist, and I don't want you to please take this as a raise a racist comment. I'm I'm going to tell you very briefly about the different cultures of people that I've worked with in the past, beginning with Nike. Uh, when I was in Nike, I was on the Nike.com team. Um, I was on lots of teams, but when I got on the, the, the latter part of the Nike.com team, uh, I was one of one, two, three, four Americans and probably eight of the rest of them were Indian nationals who were working in, in their group and, and they kicked ass. I mean, they were really, really good. And I loved working with them. They were so much fun to work with. Um, I worked with, uh, as a, as a systems engineer for consolidated freeways, um, for IBM, I worked with, uh, I, I, you know, that was uh, pretty much a, a pretty fair mix. Um, and there's, there's really no, no, there, there were different nationalities there, but there was, there was nothing that were really notable about the differences between the nationalities in that particular group, uh, in terms of, you know, skill level. Uh, when I was, uh, in, um, when I, when I was in, uh, well, I don't know how to say that. So yeah, when I was at IBM and I worked with a group, uh, there, I worked with two nationalities really a lot. I worked with, uh, um, very closely with an Italian team who was absolutely hands down my favorite team to ever have worked with. They were so much fun and so gregarious and, and got shit done. Uh, but they had a lot of problems in their code, which, which seems like a cliche thing to say, but that was, that was actually what happened. That was my actual experience. Um, uh, I, I worked with a bunch of people from Romania, uh, who our entire team was Romanian except for me and like two others uh, on Tivoli and, and then some of them are, might be out there. One And, and I got to tell you, great people really. And Pavel uh, has actually gone on to do some amazing things. Um, uh, very, very, very dogmatic in their technology selections. 
uh, very offensive when they make, uh, usually they were very offensive. There was one, one dude who was such an asshole and you just, you just couldn't disagree with him. He just, you know, and, um, so that was, but technically speaking, they were pretty good. They, none of them could do the C code though. So they made me do the C code. And I'm not saying that to toot my own horn. That really surprised me. Um, I had to do the C code because none of them could do it. And it was a typically support team. So maybe that wasn't a good indicator, but, um, and what else? Uh, the, since then, uh, where am I from? I am, I am actually from the United States. Yeah. I was born and raised in Utah and lived in California for a while. Lived in Oregon for six years or so. Lived in Tucson for three years. I don't mind people knowing my story. I, and then I'm out on the East coast these days. So yeah. And then, uh, but, but, um, at my LinkedIn, I went to, Oh my God. Did you really, did you do, did you, did you do the, uh, did you do the, that thing where they let you go to high school at the community college? Yeah. I taught the game. Yeah, you did. Oh, good for you, man. Yeah. I taught, um, we've actually thought about moving out to Concord. Yeah. Yeah, that's where he's, he's, he's talking, our right, Ron County Community College. That's the one that's out there. That's where I that's where I first started teaching. Uh, oh wow, that's fantastic, guys. Um, yeah, I used to teach. Uh, 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 I used to teach. Uh, I, I taught the the game developer summer camps there for a while. For a while, <laughs> I did teach. I I did taught web design one year, and then I gave it up because. I, people just weren't motivated and you might've been way motivated, but the people that were in the just did not want to be there. And I just, I hate teaching people who don't want to learn. I hate it. I can't do it. That's why I had to leave. I, I was, I've been invited to teach in private schools a lot, but I always leave because even in private school, there's people who don't want to be there. I hate it. I, <laughs> I, I hate teaching people who don't want to learn. It's like cracking the whip. Who fuck wants to do that? Nobody wants to do that. I want to work with people who are hungry to learn. And I know that, you know, yeah, it's like, seriously, how do you have a system where the people that are there don't implicitly want to learn? Now people have theories on this. Sir Ken Robinson's best theory on this is that people don't want to learn um, because they've had it beaten out of them. They've had their creativity and curiosity beat out of them by the traditional education system from the time they were kindergartner. If you look at how kindergartners are taught, they're allowed to explore and check out the blocks and play with them and everything. And Montessori, of course, continues on that idea for a long time. But but at a certain point, it's like, no, shut up and do what I tell you. Am I wrong? <laughs> I mean, you know, and and that works really well for the people in power. Because they don't want people to learn to think on their own. And they don't want them to realize that they don't they don't need the system. Um, how did I learn to code? Uh, I'm completely self-taught. I've had, I had a CS 101 class once upon a time and a couple classes in hypercard in college, but, um, everything I've learned, I've, I've learned on my own from the time I was 14. And I'm not saying that to brag. I, I just, you, you, you meet people like this and I don't know if it's a natural instinct. I believe it is. I believe it's that everyone has a natural instinct to be curious and to learn. And a lot of people give it up about my subjects, except my own thing. Yeah. Filling with computers because that was the only thing that didn't teach at school. Right. And, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's it. I, I was curious with computers from a very early age. My dad and my grandpa, I should say, uh, who was gonna, he, his whole, his family, his father before him was a coal miner and, he was going to have to go die of black lung and be sent to the coal mines if he didn't get out of there. And, you know, he said anything but coal and he got himself a university degree, started learning computers and accounting. And he basically took his whole posterity in the direction of education and intelligence. So think about that for a second. Let's let me, that's a good thing to wrap up on. You know, the decisions you make in your life uh, about how proactively you aggressively go after your learning are going to, impact your family for generations whether it be greg who's who's tutoring his niece in in scratch or it's uh or you know or this is a true story by the way he's the son of a utah pioneer you know and um and you know what so my 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 grandpa he's i was the oldest grandson he took me he said 
He goes, Rob, you know, he showed me the old, you know, punch cards, everything. He goes, you should learn to code, but not, but don't just learn to code, learn an industry. And then, cause coding will be everywhere. And I was just naturally curious. I was also a really pathetic geek. And so I took a lot of refuge in Dungeons and Dragons and coding and, um, not necessarily at the same time. So I, I did, I taught myself the first program I made was, was, uh, on an Atari 400 with a membrane keyboard to do Dungeons and Dragons characters. And I was sold, you know, cause it was a tool to give me what I wanted. Yeah. My, my grandfather coded. Yep. He coded, um, on like, 70s computers right so he actually did punch cards and all that jazz he was an accountant though so he he was one of the ones who when 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 the idea of him having a personal computer he could write his own accounting on he was a genius by the way also war veteran amazing amazing human being uh you know human all the less right alcoholic for a time and uh, mormon yeah and uh, anyway so yeah and he uh you know he just he, 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 I don't know if it was him or if I was just interested in it. You know, I just, the first time I saw one, I just wanted to know everything about it. Mostly I saw it as a tool to, to do what I wanted. And I would, I would go so far as to say that a lot of autodidacts, people who, who get into this stuff, uh, I think a lot of them are driven. There's, there's like a different level of curiosity that morphs into into this sort of addiction for learning things how to do things efficiently and discovery and and i think it's i think it's built off of the fundamental drive for exploration and learning and progress that's in all humans and i do i agree with i would agree with ken robinson i think it's i think it's i think the traditional school systems beat it out of you don't think for yourself you have to do what we're going to tell you you can't do it, it, we uh, oh no way man we can't just let you to your own devices that's what socrates would have you do right his parapolitics they walked around and talked and they experimented with life and and they 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 taught people that they had everything within their own power to learn and I, i'm just a real big fan of that so i think that's where my computer thing came from that's all i'm trying to say is i, I got really obsessed with it and then then you know as a teenager, I discovered cars and girls and dancing. Oh my God, dancing, dancing every night, all night <laughs> and, uh, dropped computers for God, six years. And then in my twenties, I picked it up back again at college and we started going back into it because it's just, again, it's just a tool to get what you want. And when you, all you want is to date a cute girl, you learn how to play guitar and ride skateboards and go dancing because <laughs> those are the tools of the trade. <laughs> The tools, the tools of a trade, of getting of getting chicks. <laughs> you know, those are the tools. So, it's just always been about learning what what's the next you know, what's the next tool, what's the next skill I need. Uh, I just want to do something when I start. Yeah, uh, I'm starting. I'm starting to want to do something when I start to do that thing. Yeah, and you know, and it really, it really is all about internal internal you know uh did the tools work oh god yeah <laughs> oh the stories my my wife tells me that i need to write she goes what you should do is just to write a book and oh brooke brooke i could tell your last name i remember her <laughs> there's like so many people i remember yeah she was a gymnast and a dancer Sigh. She literally knocked my tooth out once because I had brace. I had a, a bridge, and she knocked it out because she was kissing me. I come back from pizza. It's time for me to go to bed. I'm telling you my random stories. Include the love stories in a serious book. Uh we it was it was all '80s, man. It, it was the strangest thing. So I mean, it's my generation, right? But we, I grew up on Led Zeppelin, Billy Joel, Pink Floyd. Every time we go dance, we go skiing, right? We'd we'd slough school and go skiing. Don't stay in school, people, or don't. <laughs> we would go water skiing and we would go, and then all of us we were listening. Everybody was listening to, to you know, classic rock. And we had a we had a friend from England, uh, who kind of came into our posse in sort of high school, middle school. We were playing Dungeons and Dragons. This is, this is long. My great great friends from middle school and high school, junior high. 
we were playing Dungeons and Dragons, you know, and then we kind of grew out of it. And then we, we were doing band stuff and, you know, playing music and, and, you know, skating and thing. And then, and, and skiing and then out of nowhere. So we can make friends with this guy from England. And it was right before the Euro invasion that hit the, the Northwest. Yeah. And everything was, we started listening to Depeche Mode. I kid you not. We went, we went from, like wearing shirts with uh like no i didn't i never i was never a hairband dude let me just i'm gonna put that out there i <laughs> was never a hairband but my some of my friends did uh but but yeah i loved led zeppelin and loved we played led zeppelin we played D. yeah and then uh listen to pink floyd all that van halen and then overnight we were listening to the mode and 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 uh, oh god, who, who was the other one? UB40 and Bronski Beat and and you know yeah, not uh, what's their faces? They got really mainstream really fast. We knew them way before they were mainstream. Dead or Alive. Yeah, we we were dancing in clubs to Dead or Alive a good year before anybody in America knew who they were, and and that was that was our sort of skate punk times. Yeah time for me to go to bed hey it's been great talking um uh, i feel like you're a forgotten music legend left the industry a ministry oh yeah ministry is a little bit after us guys yeah ministry i actually saw ministry live yep 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 in fact my friend is is of course the Corey. and i won't tell you his last name You'd know, you might know him actually but my friend Corey. uh he he played he played he was he played in an opening band for ministry at the fairgrounds in Utah. Yep. Well, I'll never forget that. That was, that was really amazing. Um, yeah, it was a long time ago though. It was a long time ago. <laughs> you gotta understand for me, ministry is, is kind of slightly after my time. Like when I was really doing stuff, we were, yeah, we were, you know, quintessential eighties kids. So, at least in that time. I think what's so great about it is there was so much prosperity that, that you could literally get a job at the grocery store. It's kind of sad to say now. And and you go dancing five nights a week in the summer and stay out till 3 a.m., you know, eating jelly-filled donuts <laughs> and making out with, with <laughs> goth chicks in the swings. Oh, my God, the memories. I have to stop now. I have to stop now. It's time for me to move on to, to something else. I tell you what, when we come back, maybe, but my wife, my wife tells me I need to write down all these little stories and just before I forget them all and put them in a book is like vignettes or something. Cause I have so many fucking stories. I, I, I just I do. And I, I say it because I'm just, you know, I, it just, yeah, I don't know. It just, it's fun. It's fun to reminisce, you know, somewhat as long as you don't dwell on it. Right. So, Whatever. Yeah, Deshaw. Deshaw, if you're out there, if you're out there listening to this, Deshaw, I still want to see that fur, what's under that fur coat. <laughs> I got to go to bed. On that note, <laughs> on that note, tomorrow I'll be back quoting, quoting boring things for your, for your edutainment. Uh, I think that's a word that uh, mastermind invented. So that's not mine. Uh, and I will be coding um, uh, languages to define other languages so that I can get busy building the knowledge net. And perhaps sometime along the way tomorrow, I'll do a beginner video of some kind. I don't, I can't promise what it's going to be. Uh, the list of streamers on the Knowledge Fellowship Discord. There's some feedback. Oh shit! Should I go look there? <laughs> the streamers on the Knowledge Fellowship Discord. There's a few. That, okay. Well, that's good. I like to know where you guys are finding me and all that. I do appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, appreciate it. Um, I'm, you know, I'm just here. I'm just here. So thank you for, for checking in and we'll see y'all, uh, tomorrow. If you want to come on, I don't know how early it'll be. I'll probably actually have to unpack the car tomorrow morning. So I'm guessing about 11 a.m. My, my time, which is in 12 hours. It's been really fun. Thank you for checking in and talk. 